So hello everyone. I hope you are all doing fine. Thank you for coming to the FinML Create conferences. Today we are pleased to introduce Timothy Delis, a PhD candidate in mathematics at University of Montreal. Tim is also recipient of FinML Create grant. The presentation topic is option pricing via neural SDEs and martingale pricing theory. The meeting will be recorded. Please put your microphone on mute. And if you have any question, you can interrupt Tim and ask it, uh, ask, uh, ask, ask it to him di directly. Otherwise, you can write it down in the chat. So let's give the floor to Tim. Okay, thank you, Fatu. Um, yes, so today I'll be talking about um, an original idea, although it is seen more as like a natural extension of some existing uh, ideas and technology. Um, the basic uh, new technology we're looking at is neural SDEs, which we will be uh, talking about uh, a little bit more. And then um, basically the idea that we can model uh, uh, an underlying financial asset price process with a neural SDE. And then, so what is the ramifications of that uh, with Martin Gale price and pricing theory? Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions or need clarification on anything, please stop me and we'll just kind of talk about it. There's going to be several ideas that are kind of popular in their own right, but probably not really put together in this way uh, before. So, um, so yeah, like I said, any, any questions, just let me know. And so uh, here we go. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, neural SDEs, what they are, a little bit about them and how we're going to use them. And then we'll, I'll introduce uh, just very briefly the Martingale theory of arbitrage pricing, um, which may be familiar to some of you if you're studying uh, financial mathematics. And then um, this idea of a bound um, on the error of our uh, options price that we're, that we're computing. So... Uh, first of all, uh, neural SDEs. So very simply, uh, neural uh, SDE is, uh, stands for stochastic differential equation, which is a core part of financial mathematics. And so neural SDEs are very simply uh, uh, stochastic differential equations where we represent the drift and diffusion functions as uh, neural networks. And so it took a little while for me to you know see how really kind of simple the idea is so um, in order to help help with that I, I made this next slide um, and so in a one-dimensional stochastic differential equation case which is kind of what we're used to using in, in uh, textbook examples about finance um, it's basically this simple we have uh, you know uh, mu theta here um, the theta uh, like that is written a lot of times it's shorthand notation used in machine learning to say that this is like a parameterized function. And so this is a, a neural network, a mu theta, and theta stands for the, the parameters which get tuned during training. And so the input here is uh, T and, uh, and, the, and XT, the value of the, the process. And uh, so this is the idea that uh, our general drift term is now represented by a neural network and the same with the diffusion term which is a, which in in the experiments you'll see here today are actually identical you know configurations for feed forward uh, neural networks and so there's two inputs one output and you have some densely collected layers here um, and in a very general way that this, this is a uh, this is it And so the, the idea here is that with neural SDEs is that um, basically they are, you know, there's, they are universal function approximators, uh, just like, you know, normal uh, neural networks. There's lots of, there's a few results for different types of neural networks and how they uh, approximate functions. And so the, the main result that I want to show here is that we have an equivalence to the universal approximation theorem, but with uh, for measures in a measure space. And so this uh, result, which was presented by in the 
Ten and Rajinsky's uh, paper in 2019. Um, let me see, I'm covered up here. So in, in, in our case, X is our process and X one, one is the time. So we're looking at, at time one, we have some, uh, some target measure and we start at zero with, from our process. And this theorem says that basically we can approximate any target measure with a neural network implemented as just the drift function of a, a stochastic differential equation. Um, you know, to an arbitrary accuracy. And so this is, uh, you know, kind of based on this now, uh, we, we say, okay, well, um, you know, price processes at any time produce certain distributions, which we consider measures uh, on a measure space. And in fact, uh, options pricing is based on this idea. And so um, with this idea, uh, we think that uh, neural SDEs then can approximate kind of any price process and, and so that they can also uh, match any measure in, in the measure space at uh, any time to an arbitrary accuracy. So this is the idea here. So more kind of after this, uh, this initial result had come out, kind of more research has been put into like, how do we train uh, neural SDEs? And just highlight here that something that's usually brought up in, in financial mathematics classes, this Euler Mariyama approximation, which is kind of like a, just a, a way to simply simulate uh, STEs. And at a very basic level, uh, this is what, uh, what we do to train neural STEs. You basically simulate them and this is how you, you get output from them. And based on this output, and then you adjust the weights of, of your uh, SDE. So a popular, very popular method that came out um, was this latent SDE method. Uh, I just want to point out here, it's called scalable gradients for stochastic differential equations. Um, and the, the authors of this also made a very accessible software package, which uh, applies to more than just what they did. But um, they basically here uh, want to learn time series with latent SDEs kind of in the same way that uh, like a recurrent neural network will try to learn a time series with this hidden state. Um, so this is an, an idea here, which they put together and they, they define a nice method for, for training. And a, a more recent approach was to treat uh, neural SDEs as generative adversarial nets. And so this is the idea that I use uh, with this paper. So the next couple of slides we'll be talking about generative adversarial nets and how they fit into this idea. So the basic idea of a, a generative, uh, so I'll call it a GAN, right? Uh, the idea of a GAN is that we have this generative function, which in our case will be a neural SDE, but in the original GAN paper, this is uh, uh, could be a feed forward neural network, some other neural network. Uh, and so you start with some random initialization, which is a, in the domain of X, which is called the source. And then this maps to domain Y, which is uh, the target distribution. And so very simply what a GAN is trying to do is that uh, we simple sample from Omega from the source distribution, we feed it through our generative function, and then it's gonna match the target distribution. Um, this is what this is the goal and so like training the generative function here is the process of getting these distributions as close as possible. So this is a popular um, visualization from the uh, original GAN paper just wanted to put here to show you you know the idea that we're going to be looking at is very similar to this you in the, the black dotted line here is our, the target distribution. Okay, this is like a one dimensional example. Um, and A, B, C, D is kind of the time during training. So an initialization, our green is our a, um, gener generated distribution. So at the beginning of training, the generated distribution doesn't match uh, the target distribution. But as training progresses, you end up with the, gen the generated distribution matching exactly the target distribution, you know, in the best case scenario. And here the blue line 
it has something else to do with GANs, which is the discriminator, which we don't really need to, to worry about um, right now. But this is the idea. We have this target distribution. We're trying to fit our, uh, our data um, to our, our function to match this, uh, to match this uh, target distribution. So the, another popular improvement over the GAN architecture was called the Wasserstein GAN. Um, which uses the same idea, except um, now we use the Wasserstein distance as the metric for training this, uh, this network. Um, and so we can actually think about it in the same way as the previous picture, but uh, just like the mathematics become different. And the, using the Wasserstein distance um, as an objective function uh, created a much uh, better training performance. And that's why it's been used. Uh, more, uh, more recently, and now the the SDE GAN paper, which I pointed out, uh, uses this uh, this approach as well. So, the Wasserstein distance. One of the definitions uh, we can represent it in this form here. Oops. And so, what my approach here in the paper. Um, is that we implement the Wasserstein distance as a closed form loss function. Um, this simplifies the idea of, of a GAN. It's technically not a GAN, although what it's doing effectively is the same thing as the, as the GAN in, in that we're trying to minimize the Wasserstein distance between the target and the uh, source distribution. And so it, this is still in general uh, notation here with two measures, mu and, and new the uh the Wasserstein distance the, the the one Wasserstein distance is defined in this way so it's a it's a distance between uh mu and new and the idea is that when they're the same this is a zero okay and when they're just different um it's also you know this is referred to as the earth mover distance it's a it's a metric distance metric about how far apart the two distances are and um, there's a dual formulation. This is, a, um, you know, once we computed a Wasserstein distance, it actually gives us a bound, um, you know, we convert the uh, notation into this expected value uh, form here. And so once you compute your, your distance for any function, uh, F, which is a, a Lipschitz function of one or less, um, is bounded by the Wasserstein distance. So this is a, an idea that we're going to use for options pricing coming up. And so just a very one slide review about uh, the Martingale theory of arbitrage pricing. Um, so we have a price process uh, S. Oops. Price process S, you know, starting at a small T and, end, and in this case, ending at a big T. Okay, and uh, we have an options contract, which is evaluated usually at the, the time t, big T, which is uh, expiration. And uh, this is a call option contract, which is the, uh, the max of, of the price minus a K, which is the strike price of the option contract. And notice that this is a Lipschitz one function. Okay, um, just writing here, we have this Gersonov Martingale transform, um, which we'll use in the next, uh, the next part here. So, so the options price, and, and here I, I kind of leave out the uh, rate, the rate of interest. So R equals uh, zero, small r. And so the, uh, the options price, according to this uh, theory, is the expected value of the options price uh, at expiration, but um, over the equivalent Martingale measure, which we're calling Q on this slide. Uh, it's uh, also called the risk neutral equivalent Martingale measure. And um, you know, this is the kind of mathematics that's gone through in a lot of the uh, option pricing theory in textbooks. And I just wanted to kind of put out the steps here um, that it, one way to kind of compute this uh, empirically, which is the way we use here, is that um, just kind of by salt, like simplifying this equation a little bit. So we just substitute in our price process here for ST and then we, rearrange the terms so we kind of single out this uh, expression which is actually the Brownian motion under this risk neutral measure. 
so that we can kind of convert this back into our natural probability measure without uh, without this uh, special uh, cue here uh, by replacing this with the Brownian motion. And so it's interesting to see here that in fact the the options price only depends on the stochastic integral part of an SDE, which which kind of makes sense because uh, you know the risk neutral measure is the one where we kind of re re remove the drift, okay, and we're only worried about the uh, the, the diffusion. Um, so here in the, in the experiments we we kind of we compute the options by evaluating this part here in numerically. Um, so now we're trying to put together this whole idea into what I'm calling neural options pricing. And so the workflow is this, that we, we collect data of the underlying asset um, and you fit the neural SDE to the data and then you compute the options price. Um, and it's really kind of that, that simple. So the, the basic idea here is like, uh, you know, does this work? And um, you know, how, how do we use it? So, okay, a little more detail for the problem setup. So we assume that our target, which is the data we have comes from some target process, which we're calling R. And then we have a neural SDE, which we call S. And through training, we're trying to minimize the distance here. Mu and nu sh should require, um, they refer to the distributions of R big T and S big T at some time, big T. So we're minimizing the, the Wasserstein distance at some time of these two, uh, processes. And in fact, during training, we, we evaluated that many times. Um, so it's not really just one time we're evaluating at. But the, the point here is that the, the Washington one distance that we compute uh, during training, um, it gives a bound for all the Lipschitz one functions that we call F here. Um, so this is a bound, which is our Weinstein distance. And for any F in the family of Lipschitz one functions, we have this inequality. And so in the notation of the stochastic processes, that's equivalent to this uh, inequality here. Um, and we notice that the option function is, the, is a Lipschitz one function. And so, but we really want is a bound on the error of the options prices implied by the two models. So before we, we called Q our risk neutral measure. Here we're calling W the risk neutral measure with, re with respect to S and V the risk neutral measure with respect to R. And so this is actually the options price at time big T, you know, of, uh, of the, the um, based on the process S and this is the options price based on R. And so if R is our target and S is our model, then, uh, you know, this, this is actually the error in the options price according to the target, um, you know, compared to our, our model. And so this is the error that we're looking to bound. And so I, I pose a conjecture, which I think in most general form here is probably not correct, but I, I'm putting it here anyways, because I think it's a, it is interesting and hoping to spark some conversation about it that um, I'm, proposing that this error in the options price is actually bounded by um, the, uh, the Wasserstein one distance basically. Um, but the way I wrote it here is with, uh, so if you, in the previous slide, we have that the Wasserstein one distance is greater than or equal to this for any F, for any function F in the family of functions. And so our, uh, so given F in this family of function, I'm saying that the difference in the options prices, so the error on our calculated options price is less than, than this uh, computed bound here. Um, and so the, we kind of did a, an experiment to uh, illustrate this idea. I think things will be much clearer after this. Um, so what, we, what I did is a sample the data from a geometric Brownian motion, which, um, we're going to know the parameters and distribution, which in practice, we're not going to know. But this is uh, an example in order to kind of uh, vet this pipeline. So we sample our data from the geometric Brownian motion, and then we fit the neural SDE to the empirical samples, and then we compute the call price. And then we compare this call price from our neural SDE to the closed form solution that we can compute 
based on the geometric Brownian motion that we actually know the parameters and distribution for. So this is some way we have to evaluate the error in our uh, computer options price. And this is a, a little video of that what what uh, about what happens during training. And so I just explain what it what you're looking at first, and then I'll play the video. And so on the left, we have at time one. So we start at time zero, and the initial position of both of our uh, target and model is one. Okay, and, uh, and then we sample from uh, from geometric Brownian motion, and that's the blue the blue histogram. In green, I've plotted the theoretical uh, density, uh, which is a log normal density. Um, but the actual distribution of the samples is, which is about a thousand samples per batch, is in blue. And now orange is the same, is a, a similar distribution, but produced from our neural SDE after random initialization. So we can see the, uh, the distributions don't match really at all at initialization and the neural SD has this very skinny spiky distribution where the, uh, the target is, uh, is the geometric running motion a little bit wider with, we pick some random values for the uh, drift and diffusion constants. And on the right side, uh, the blue is the theoretic uh, Black-Scholes options price computed based on the, the price process of the target, which is in blue and the orange is the options price computed by the uh, neural SDE, which corresponds to orange. So blue is blue and orange is orange here. And on the X axis are different strike prices for this option. So here we actually have several prices, uh, so several option contracts that we're looking at all expiring at the same time, but for different strikes. Okay, and so what, you're, what we're now looking at during the video is iterations of training. So we're drawing batches uh, from the, the target and from the, the neural SDE, computing the Wasserstein distance <clears throat> and propagating the gradients um, through the neural SDE in order to try to minimize this distance. And we can see what happens, uh, which is actually pretty quickly, is that we get uh, the generated model to match pretty well you know, you can see even there's a lot of variation in the histograms for each batch. So you get to a point where you kind of level out on how, how close you can get. But we can see, I mean, visually, it looks like we're, we're matching a lot of the, the aspects of the uh, target distribution here. And we also see that our, um, oh, we also see that our uh, options price for the several different strikes, you know, the shape definitely matches and the distance is, uh, is pretty close. Um, so here um, I have a little visualization, which is three different uh, examples of the same experiment, three different trials where we have picked at randomly different parameters for just drift and diffusion of the geometric branding motion here in blue. See this one is uh, kind of, uh, not kind of a medium height and this one is kind of wider and shorter and uh, and also three different random initializations of the neural SDE. And then in the middle here we have, after we've trained them, you know, things match up well and the, the options prices match up well. And then finally in the last column, we're looking at this, uh, this bound that uh, I'm proposing. So blue is the Wasserstein distance, which we use as a loss during training. And the orange is actually the, uh, the maximum error that we saw in any of our computed uh, options prices. So visually speaking, we do see this idea that the Wasserstein distance is greater than or equal to the, um, the error in the options price. And for finally, for one more experiment to address this, uh, this bound issue, um, I initialized a thousand pair of neural SDEs. So without training them, this is an idea of just kind of comparing um, random SDEs and seeing how this, you know, the behavior of this bound. And so between every pair of uh, randomly initialized neural SDEs, I, I compare the, the Wasserstein distance and 
the maximum error of the options prices for a certain range of, of strike there. And uh, what we find is that, um, you know, the, the blue line here would be where the distance equals the, the maximum error. And so we can see that uh, the error is generally speaking is less than or equal to the uh, the maximum distance although you do have kind of one data point here which strays quite over the line and this is actually the important part of this graph is this this lower part so um you know it raises some more questions and and uh, gives me a little bit of motivation to uh, uh further investigate the the mathematics of this bound and so just finally, just wanted to say that I mentioned some difficulties and motivations about this work is that um, this pipeline currently only works for one dimension the way I, I've done it. Um, and the reason for this is that the closed form computation of the Weierstein distance in higher dimensions is, is extremely expensive. Um, even in, if you go up to two dimensions and you try to get a pretty good resolution of a distribution in two dimensions, you have to do lots of computations for this Wasserstein distance and it you know quickly becomes uh, like too expensive to do. Um, so one possibility is to actually use the, the SDE GAN formulation which trains the uh, SDE as a GAN and not with the, cl the closed form uh, loss function and there is a way to compute the Wasserstein distance using this formulation although it might be much noisier than a direct computation. And then uh, finally about the conjectured bound, um, you know, it may not be true in its most general form, but um, I think that, you know, based on the previous figure too, that the general behavior is there. And so it may, you know, be able to find, uh, you know, a modified version that, uh, that is true. And, um, and that's it. I kind of wanted to get through it all in case there was questions, because uh, I'm sure I didn't do the greatest job explaining everything, but uh, thank you for listening. And I uh, please welcome any, anything at all. If you wanna go over some of the background of the different parts, or you wanted me to go over something again, please just, uh, just let me know. Hello. Yes. Um, first, uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Oh, and no problem. then I was curious to know how long um, does it take to train uh, uh, this model here for one dimensional process? So yeah, this, um, this took, I wanted to say for this experiment, which was three trials, I think it took like five or six hours on my uh, server, which has a GPU. It's not the newest GPU, but it does uh, have a GPU and um, yeah, I, I also, you know, I started this research using, um, well, I, I did use the Torch SDE package, but I tried to convert um, code directly from, sorry, from these two papers that I mentioned, which are actually in the same, you know, GitHub uh, repository. And yeah, it those both take a long time as well. <laughs> and so that was kind of what motivated me to try to find a different training technique which was much faster than these but also ended up you know taking taking a while to, to do what I wanted to do to get a night you know I was looking to get a really nice tight fit basically and it was difficult to do with uh, with some of the existing code that was up there so yeah okay, thank you so uh, this couldn't be used in like uh, live trading let's say um no well I mean I don't know you the thing is, once you train the model, you don't have to retrain it, right? I mean, you can spend time training the model in between sessions, mm -hmm. right? But no, I mean, there are, yeah, I mean, I think um, performance is one of the main issues right now with training uh, neural SDEs in general. So, uh, yeah, that's why it's kind of an exciting field for research, I think. Um, I have a question. Sure. So your 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 target is is the the distribution i guess but right. if we're doing the why why like if we're thinking about this in classical kind of mathematical finance okay like if we observe the prices of options and we calibrate to the observed prices so right is that 
I mean, maybe I missed something, but do you get- Yeah, no, this is a, this is a, um, this is actually probably this kind of idea, like even predates that idea, right? I mean, I know what you're saying. Like usually you have prices you calibrate, for example, the Black-Scholes model to match the prices. And then that will tell you what the implied volatility is, right? Um, things like that. But in fact, the, you know, the original Black-Scholes model is, uh, gives you an option price based completely on the underlying, the distribution, you know, the behavior of the underlying asset. And so that's the idea that we're using here. So in fact, yeah, you don't need a, you don't need to train a model on uh, options prices. Well, I'm not sure like if from a practitioner point of view, if, if the, they would accept that, but uh, there was a recent paper on neural SDs and arbitrage free models by Sam Cohen and some of his co-authors. I'm going to put it in the chat. Oh, you thank you. Might wanna, you might want to look at, look at that. It might be related to what you're doing. So. Oh, it's not just by the, uh, just by the name. It sounds like it, like it is. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Nice talk. No, thanks. Yeah. I mean, about uh, that as well. I, you know, I understand, you know, I understand that there's uh, that it's not so simple and, and uh, you know, you have lots of things like the uh, volatility smile and, and things that like it doesn't uh, all the prices, all the options prices don't follow the same kind of model in this way. So, yes, I understand that it's probably it, like I, I, right now I, I find it more of like a theoretical tool and I think it might be more interesting in um, in environments where you really don't understand the underlying process as well as we do like with uh, in stocks or with uh, you know this kind of uh, return but you know i'm still learning about it as well so so i have a, a quick question sure uh, thank you very much for your presentation team no uh, problem. so what is the idea behind uh, the neural stochastic differential equation uh, compared with the classical ito SDE, because we know everything about the SDE, ETA, right. how to calibrate everything. And uh, so what is the advantage? Well, the, my, the, the advantage here is that we can kind of apply this. Uh, we can fit the, 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 the advantage of the neural SD is that you can fit it to seemingly any distribution, right? If you have data from that, you don't know the, uh, you know, you don't know the underlying process. You don't know what the equation is, uh, what the SDE is that produces it. Then you fit uh, a neural SDE and uh, you have some idea, you know. So here the idea is that like we can price an option based on just observing, you know, the underlying, uh, the underlying process. Where, yes, I mean, the, the point is that we can use all this great stuff we learn about, we know about general SDEs without having to assume that we actually know the form of the SDE of the underlying. That's kind of, that's the real benefit here, in my opinion. So can, can we add jump, for example, and to proceed with the same idea or no? Yeah, I think so. That's kind of where, where I want to go with this is that, um, hmm. other kind of stochastic processes, right? Instead of just, uh, you know, this kind. Um, there's also like the, the, something very popular for options pricing, the Sabre volatility, uh, yeah. model, you know, I'm interested in, in trying to look into how we can, you know, use neural SDEs there as well. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, that's kind of, that's the point is that like maybe these, these processes that don't, you don't know, um, how to write them out in SDE form, but with a neural SDE, you can still do the same kind of math, uh, without having to you know, you decide on a certain model, basically. Do you know any paper that exists with jumps, applications of neural stochastic differential equation with jumps? No. Not yet, okay. Thank you very much for your talk yeah. and answers. Yeah, okay, good luck. You. Thanks. Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, just piggybacking on uh, piggybacking on Antley's question. 
So if you did start sure. to include a underlying process with like jump diffusion, how would your Wasserstein distance loss function respond to that? Are there any like would that change the way that your loss function behaves in any way? I really I'm not familiar enough with jump processes to to accurately answer the question, but I would love to investigate that. Um, would yeah, I mean I'd have to read more about what they are, but could you like recommend like a, a certain process, you know, that you're thinking of? I don't know. No, no, okay. just, uh, just wondering, curious. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think, um, anyway, it gives me a good direction to, to, to look at, uh, for the future here. No, oh, thanks. Super cool. Yeah. But I mean, I think the idea is that like, uh, you know, the, the, the whole point of kind of that, uh, that expressivity, well, one of the points about it is that, uh, you know, any target measure can be approximated with an, with a, well, with an SDE. And then they're saying that you can, then you can approximate any of these SDEs with a neural SDE. That's the point of this. Uh, so I'm not sure, like I said, I don't know enough about the jump processes to, uh, say, okay. So uh, another question here, are there any impacts on the assumptions of the Feynman CAC theorem? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, which assumptions uh, are we talking about? The Martin, I know the Martin Gale theory of uh, arbitrage pricing, you know, use, you know, relies somewhat on the Feynman CAC theorem. So, you know, I don't think that there's any contradictions there or problems there. Although I know that I've left the math very uh, kind of <laughs> loose. And so, yeah, um, you know, there's lots of kind of details in there about the lipsciousness of the neural networks and, and things. Yes, if I can uh, go back sure. to the original question. Um, as far as I understand, you need to train the neural network uh, given the uh, initial price, right? And then you get the distribution at the final time. Is that correct? Right, that's right. So in, in that case, if I understand correctly, you would have to retrain the whole model each time the initial uh, price changes. to get the corresponding distribution at that, the final time. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, from, so I'm just thinking about it out loud, but um, the way I see the neural SDE is like that it can just replace, you know, our idea is that we can replace the, the SDE that we normally use. So once you've trained the neural SDE, you can actually apply it for at whatever start time, you know, at whatever initial price that you want really. You know, it's a like the, so a neural SD is like a generative model. Um, you know, you, you feed, you know, you can uh, given some initial condition, initial location, then you can simulate it using like Euler Mariyama simulation, um, just because just based on the you know the neural network uh, functions that you have for drift and diffusion. Okay, so you learn the drift and the diffusion. That's right. And then you take them and solve. Yeah, the you SD actually, yeah, okay, exactly. So I you see, actually I end see. up with a, with a usable like SDE that you can, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So then you need a way to solve it, right? Yes. And that's the, that's the whole point of the training is that how are we going to, you know, adjust these neural networks so that the functions, uh, you know, do what we think we want them to do, which is in this case is match, you know, the distributions of uh, this target data. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right. Okay, I see another question here. Can the American options uh, use the price using the same framework, how would the option to exercise? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, something. So the American option, I mean, I think um, 
you know, one of the points here is that we're actually just learning the underlying process. So how you use this uh, neural SDE afterward is really up to you. In this case, we use it to price a European option, which in general is much easier to do than the American option. So I don't think, uh, you know, you'd have a problem based on the neural SDE, you know, any difference in that to price the, the American option. Although off the top of my head, I don't know um, exactly how we would do that. <laughs> I would have to read up on it a little bit, but I, like I said, we're just learning the dynamics of the underlying. So, um, you know, the American option, the option contract doesn't matter, you know, about like it doesn't uh, influence that. So um, I think, uh, you know, you could try to use some kind of similar approach for the American option for sure. Hey, Tim. Hi, Cedric. How's it going? All right, good. Um, ni uh, nice talk. Thank you. Um, would it be just possible to include the option prices in the loss function so that you can include that uh, additional information? So using a double loss function, for example, so uh, instead of simply fitting uh, your density with the Wasserstein function, you could mm -hmm. use like a L2 distance with the observable uh, option prices mm. at the same time because your your curves for the um, the, the the option prices weren't like really perfect no um, so maybe including including that in your last function would would right. maybe lead to uh, a better uh, well in better this case i think you're definitely Correct, but I think in practice, if you, you were to you because like we know the options prices from the Black Shoals, right? And they match the they match the math of the underlying process exactly. Um, so yeah, we might get a better fit in this case, but I think in practice, um, you know, one of the things you see at different strikes, you have different volatilities. Um, so you'd actually be doing kind of a different kind of optimization by including the. Uh, the options prices, I think. Yeah, uh, that's more like what the Saber model does is it just models the volatility. So it's these changes in the volatility at the different prices where here we're really, like I said, we're really just modeling the underlying and then showing that we can compute the options price based on that uh, underlying. So I, I know what you're saying. I think, yeah, I mean, you know, for practical reasons, there's definitely a reason to, to look into that. Um, like adding that in there. But like I said, I don't think that like it doesn't really fit into like my, my idea for for what this was uh, intended to do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. The one thing we do see is that this error, um, you know, while the, the line isn't close, the, the error still seems somewhat bounded by this Washington distance, which, uh, you know, it's going to be hard actually to get it a very super close fit based on this data you see how the data is so spiky here it's like you don't really actually want to fit that exactly and, and each batch is different so there is going to at the end there's going to be this kind of error that you can't improve on based on your you know based on your simulation Yes, it's me again, <laughs> and have yeah, another no problem, couple of please. questions. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So first, I, I was curious, how many observations do you need to train the model? Like usually, because I found the model very, or the methodology quite interesting, but the application to option pricing is confusing me a bit, because usually don't, okay. you don't want to train your model on historical data. You want to predict the future some, some right. somehow. Yeah. So that's why you reason in terms of implied volatility and so on. That's right. So the, the future in the option pricing application is confusing me a bit. While I found the training in the past quite um, quite interesting. And right. I was uh, kind of wondering how many data points you need to train your model and obtain these results. Um, well, I think I, like I said, these, um, the way I set it up was each batch is kind of uh, randomly so what you do is you sample a batch of your target data, which in practice would be empirical data. And then you sample a batch of generated data from your neural SDE, which obviously you can make as much of that as you want. In this case, in my 
um, I could also get, in this case, I could also get as much target data as I want because I'm also generating that and it's not just, uh, you know, data in a spreadsheet. And so um, I just did like, what I found is obviously here, if we, if the batch size is too small, you have kind of a very sparse looking histogram that doesn't really match the histogram that you're trying to fit. So that's what I, I found that I had to use at least probably like a thousand samples for each batch in order to just create like a smooth enough histogram like here um, to, to create like a nice signal for the, uh, you know, for the training. So it's no, I don't think it's a clear cut uh, answer or I don't have a clear cut answer, but you definitely would run into trouble. Like for example, if you only had 500 data points or something of past returns, right? I mean, at that point, you're basically stuck with the, the shape that it gives you. But if you had something more like 100,000 data points that you could then sample from randomly, that might be, uh, that might be better. I see. Yeah, that's exactly what, what I was wondering about. If that was for a daily data application or intraday high frequency data in that case. Yeah. Like, yeah. That sounds yeah. like more high frequency. Yeah. Well, yes, as far as amount of data, I mean, it, if yes. it, it's uh, yeah, daily data, you would have to go back a long time. And, and obviously, things change over the years. So it would be hard to say, you know, going forward, like you're saying, going forward, that it, things are going to. Uh, be the same as the past. Yeah, I think like with this, you'd run into a lot of the, the immediate same problems that you run into with just using Black Shoals, like in its basic format. You know, like you said, it's based on, you know, historical distribution or, or just based on some theoretical distribution that doesn't change. And, you know, it's not, uh, it's not that simple for sure. Thank you very much. Last question, then I sure. am done. Uh, I, I can't yeah. really understand the error in these plots. I was wondering on a percentage basis, more or less, how much is it? Like 10%, 20%, 0 0.1%? Um, the error here? So yeah, this error is actually an, an absolute number. Okay. Um, okay. So you know, in each one of these, it's, it's, it's the maximum yeah, it's like as the training progressed, it, it, it's the maximum distance between these these two lines here, really, um, which would be the, the orange, the maximum price error. You know, so in each one of these, the scales are a little bit different. So it does look uh, they are different. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess this would actually be in terms of money, but you know, this is a, a theor theoretical prices that are centered around one, you know, so it's not really, uh, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for, for attending and for the great questions. Um, anything else we'd like to discuss? We're just about uh, getting towards the end here. Or if anyone else has some kind of related uh, little research that you'd like to tell me about, you know, I'm always you know interested in learning more. Of course. Or well, if not, then I think that that's probably good for today. Anybody have objections? Well, then thanks all for coming. And uh, let me get back on the, again, my, put my email up here. If you would like to uh, contact me with anything um, research-based, that'd be great. If not, then, uh, you know, have a good luck with your research and everyone have a, have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Tim. Thank you. No problem. Great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So All right. Bye. So I'll stop sharing here.